John DeBorder meet Lawan Sadler. Lowry. <laughs> Hi, very nice to meet you. Hello, John. Nice to meet you as well. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Lawan <laughs> wants you to know, John, that she is a constant thorn in my side on matters political. Well, good. That's, that's we argue why about everything, and uh, we agree about almost nothing except that we love each other. I think that sounds much more exciting than marrying somebody where you wouldn't have any arguments. That's better. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> that is much, much better. No, it's good. To, it's good to not agree with your person. You can learn more, you know, because you can't leave the room, or at least not for long. So it helps. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Yeah. We've been married for eight days, something crazy like that, nine days. Uh, so That's far, right. It's only eight or nine days. It's, uh, so yeah. how is it so far? So far, so good. Yes. <laughs> We're taking it a day at a time over here. Everything is changing. I used to live in this house, and it was my house. Uh, that has changed. Oh, that. Yeah. Now That's it's my right. house. <laughs> <laughs> See? And both of your kitchen and all that. Yeah. <laughs> Not just it's the different. kitchen, man. It's the bathroom. It's not just the bathroom. It's the bedroom. It's the hallway. It's the closet. Yeah, all oh, the closets. Safe. That's right. Dressers <laughs> and things. I've been there. Yeah. Boxes. I bet. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Boxes everywhere. Okay, so we're gonna get started with our thing here. All right. So nice, nice to meet you. you. Thank you. You guys. Hope to meet you live sometimes. I would love to, and I look forward to watching your uh, this session online. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> bye bye. Great to meet you. Hey there, John. Hi, Glenn. How are you doing? Yeah, we're at the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv with the black guys, John McWhorter, Columbia University, <laughs> linguist extraordinaire, writes more books than I do. Glenn Lowry, I'm limping along here at Brown University, newly wed to the lovely Lawan Sadler, Houston, Texas. I just met her. Yeah. October 7th, 2017. Uh, proof that hope still lives, that uh, dreams <laughs> are sometimes answered. Uh, that Sometimes, yeah. The arc of this universe, I can't believe it or explain it, but it bends toward my happiness, John. Would you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's wonderful because that does not happen all the time for anybody. And that is wonderful. That is fabulous. Thank I you very much. Our viewers should know the only reason that I was not there to you know, give my own blessing is because I was in a different country. But yeah. yes, I celebrate this very much. Thanks very much, John. All right, on to the business at hand, which is America going to hell in a handbasket. And you and I being the only people between insanity and a clear-eyed vision about our political circumstances, especially as it pertains to race. Yeah. Um, John, I'm going to mention a name, and I want you to try to maintain composure. Okay. The name, the <laughs> I get name, the feeling it's going to be kind of three names. Yeah. No, the <laughs> name is Thomas Chatterton Williams. Oh, a different three. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm messing with you and the audience <laughs> because the only reason I'm mentioning the very fine young African American writer now in uh, at the Berlin uh, U.S. Academy in Berlin uh, uh, is because of who he wrote about. Is because this Thomas Chatterton Williams, a very fine young writer now in Germany, but uh, an American born and bred, married to a French woman, and uh, writing very interesting stuff. The only reason I mention him is because he had a review in the New York Times of uh, Tanahasi Coates's book. A uh, new book is a collection of uh, pieces from the Atlantic, uh, We Were Eight Years in Power. This is Mr. Coates. And uh, Williams has a sharp review of it, sharply critical, I should say. Respectful, certainly, but critical. And uh, the discourse around uh, Mr. Coates, winner of the National Book Award, winner of the MacArthur Prize Fellowship, a celebrated essayist, uh, voice of conscience for many people on matters of race, uh, what may be of interest here, and um, you chime in, is that the nature of critical reaction to him seems to be shifting in a way that allows for a more muscular and effective uh, negative response, more of a objective assessment of his writings, more of a critical engagement with his writings than the kind of hagiographic and uh, hero-worshipful, hero uh, almost uh, uh, canonization 
uh, which Mr. Coates had been enjoying heretofore. Do I misspeak, or would you agree with that? No, I would agree. And um, I find it very interesting that um, there's been kind of a flood over the past two or three weeks of pieces where each time I read one, I have to blink to see that ta Coates is actually being covered as a human being rather than as a prophet. And I found myself wondering, why all of a sudden now? Is it just a kind of natural fatigue that kicks in with any celebrity where after a couple of beats there has to be a fashion of kicking them around? And in his case, it would be rather soon for that. And it seems to me that because many people really do not think of him as a human being, but I assume that he would have been exempt from this sort of celebrity fatigue. He would just be, you know, continually celebrated, you know, the way Malcolm X has been. And it seems to me that I think something's happening that I wasn't sure ever was going to happen. I'm really surprised that it has happened. But I think that as of his piece, where he basically asserts that the victory and the rule of Trump means that America is simply a cesspool of barely veiled racism through and through, and there's nothing that can possibly be done. I think that with that thesis, this, this collection of his pieces that has just come out has become the occasion upon which the white people who are waiting in line at Zabar's and reading the New Yorker on their phones are realizing that Coates hates them every bit as much as he hates the white people, quote unquote, out there who voted for Trump. I'm not sure how they missed that from his earlier writings, but I guess you could say it was between the lines. But I think that a critical mass of people are realizing he isn't just jumping on, you know, Mrs. Western Pennsylvania who voted for this fool in office. He doesn't like these people who love him either, even though he's essentially said it. And I think that a lot of them are insulted and or they realize that if he really does hate even his educated white fans as much as he hates all the, the quote unquote heathen out there, then there's something a little bit, shall we say, theatrical, performative about his vision. Because we all know racism exists, but we also know that it's not 1950. And Ta-Nehisi Coates writes as if it's 1950, except that everybody is politer about it. I think people are actually seeing it. And so it's nice to see that he's getting treated as a person and not only by black writers. I'm happy to see Williams doing what he did. It's about time somebody put it in a mainstream organ. And it's interesting that the person at the New York Times who shepherded that piece in has told me that they got a lot of hell, including from people working in the same room as them for even putting it there. And you know, let's not forget the sort of stuff that that person had to deal with. Williams had to deal with on Twitter, not to mention the person I'm talking about. But then also some whites, you know, all of a sudden some whites, such as Ross Douthat, are actually addressing Coates as a human being with what we might call a, ra a rather nervy thesis. I like it. George Packer at the New Yorker. Mm -hmm, who fought back. He uh, didn't just... Da David no. Leonhardt, David Leonhardt at the Times, the columnist. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Both have fallen uh, within ta Coates' sights and have had a few shots uh, fired their way, but have stood up. Can you believe it? They, they stuck back. their heads out of the foxhole and they fired back. What about yeah. that? Okay, I want to say a couple of things. One of them is uh, John McWhorter and Glenn Lowry at the Blogging Heads uh, site are talking about ta Coates. Okay, get used to it. Because some of our... <laughs> uh, some of our uh, viewers are quick to say, aha, these guys are obsessed with ta Colts. And I don't know about you, but it has made me be afraid almost to raise his name in a critical inflection because I anticipate that somebody's going to say, aha, aha, our brother's just jealous. They're just ragging on Colts because they want to be ta Colts. And not only is that not true about me, I don't want anybody to even say it about me. <laughs> so, so I've been gun shy, and now, and now, and now, it looks like we can come out and say what we actually think, if, if only for a moment. Well, the other thing I wanted to say was, I've been speculating for a while, based on my own assessment of Mr. Coates's writings, uh, and you and characterize my view uh, exactly in saying it of it that it's performative, that it's uh, engaging in a certain kind of theatrical presentation, demonstration, artfully, artfully, that uh, appeals to something in the American psyche or the white liberal American 
psyche or the New York literary establishment psyche or something like that. I've been thinking, oh, this is a bubble. This can't last. This is too thin. Uh, this is too shrill. This is too predictable. This is too, uh, you know, pat. Uh, America's really much more complicated than that. It can't possibly be about race. You're not telling me that today in 2017, this is seamlessly connected to Jim Crow and slavery and it's all about the same old story of white supremacy. I understand that, you know, a propagandist would say that, but I can't believe a serious analytical journalist would take that view. And I've been thinking the whole thing's a house of cards and it's bound to blow over at any moment. I've been thinking that if you tell somebody there is no such thing as black culture that might have some pathological dimensions to it, albeit generated historically by the oppression of black people, but nevertheless taking on a life of its own, um, and they dismiss you with the back of, the, of their hand saying, you know, there ain't nothing wrong with black folks that ending white supremacy wouldn't fix. I kept thinking that, oh, that can't possibly carry the day. Soon enough, thinking people will wake up and they'll have a cup of coffee in the morning and they'll clear their heads and they'll say, oh, come on, that's bunk. That's, the, you know, that's, yeah. And it wasn't happening. I kept thinking the bubble would have to burst. Just like when you have a stock market, you know, you have a bear market and everything, a bull market, I should say, and everything is up and up and up. Eventually, it has to uh, come to a reckoning. And I kept thinking so. Um, and I've been disappointed. Time and time again. <laughs> now, you put, you put on the table an interesting hypothesis, and you're saying, uh, in effect, that some of these boosters uh, who give out the prizes and, and who uh, write the columns and who uh, script the things that go on television and, uh, you know, uh, Chuck Todd at uh, Meet the Press referring to Ta-Nehisi Coates as if he was some kind of prophet, the Martin Luther King of our day, uh, that they wake up to the fact that he hates them just as much as he hates the alt right and the and the white nationalists. I actually and think also the passive white voters for Trump who didn't care enough about race to keep him out of office. The people out there, so to speak. Yeah, who didn't you know, care about also, race? He but, hates them, but I don't think Chuck Todd would mind that. No, he wouldn't mind that, but he'd mind being hated. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. and your and your position, if I understand it, yeah, is I that think, um, uh, they're waking up to the fact that he hates them too. It's interesting about the um, the whole phenomenon in that you're talking about our jealousy, um, and remember that um, Tanahasi Coates has said that your thirst for fame in comparison to his is Saharan, which I must admit I thought that was a good line on. Come on, barrel. it was a very good line. I'm gonna give the brother credit for that. Yeah, but, <laughs> that was you a good know, line. I mean, it really you know, jealous. <laughs> It really, you know, oh, can I say, excuse me, excuse me for interrupting. It's not true, okay? <laughs> I'm very happy being the Merton P. Stoltz <laughs> Professor of the Social Sciences at Brown University, a fellow of the American Academy, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I'm, I, I'm okay, okay? <laughs> and I can honestly say, you know, I have jealousies, especially since I'm sort of in mid-career, but it's not of somebody like him. If I were offered tomorrow morning, if I got a phone call from somebody and I was offered somehow the opportunity to be America's leading writer on race with various prizes, I would turn it down. I would never want that, frankly, narrow little box to be something I was put into. I've never sought it. I don't want it. I am not jealous of him. But he does, the, the phenomenon does make me upset. And I've had to think about why it is, because I think, no, I don't want to get a MacArthur for writing about race. I would feel personally, I see how he wouldn't feel this way, but personally in terms of what I am and what my interests are, I would feel it would feel diminishing. But I think still he does stick in my craw, despite the fact that I've tried to tell you, can we please stop talking so much? You have. But it bothers me. And I figured out what it is. It's this, and I'm not going to pull back here. Um, I'm going to say what I really think because I think, you know, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. But my issue with the Coates phenomenon is that I find it racist. And I mean genuinely racist in that. The elevation of that dorm lounge performance art as serious thought is a kind of soft bigotry, which is as nauseating as it is unintended. I know that it's unintentional. I know nobody means it, but it's racism. And this is why it bothers me. 
because every time I walk around this fucking city and I deal with a lot of, you know, intellectual whites, I work on a campus full of them. And it's become a kind of shibboleth of being of that class that when you're talking to especially a black, I guess you might call me a thinking person, that you were supposed to do your gen genuflection to coats. And it's a kind of a signal that white people give somebody like me. And it's not only people with PhDs. The idea is that you are supposed to believe in that God. And every time that happens, and you talk about how racism is something that we suppose that we encounter every time we walk out into the street, I would definitely say at least once a week I have to deal with this. Some very earnest white person who's, you know, assuming that I think of that person's writing as scripture or, frankly, as brilliantly reasoned. And I feel personally insulted because, to me, they are letting pass – ooh, I – hate saying this about something or somebody, but I guess I have to. I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. They are letting pass as genius something which they never would if it was not a black person doing it. And when they do it, I feel like I'm in that scene in Annie Hall with Woody Allen where he's thinking that the people around the table, the Gentiles around the table are seeing him as this push cart Jewish person with, you know, the payas and everything. I feel like this person, and we're talking about some enlightened and often famous people, that person, when they do that genuflection, they're seeing me as some thick-lipped, step-and-fetch-it, drawling person in overalls. And I think, is that how they're judging me? Are they telling me that I'm yeah. so wonderful because yeah. they think that it's a good thing because I'm brown? It makes me sick. It has nothing to do with ta Coates as an individual. I don't think he's done anything wrong. My indictment is against the people yeah. who are elevating him out of what can only be called bigotry. I'm done. Ugh. Well, you I've got been it trying out, huh? not to say that for two years. Man, I sure hope you don't get hit by that bus, but uh, if you do, we have you on the record. <laughs> but, <laughs> did, did you see uh, the film Get Out? No, not yet. Okay. And I said why talking well, to you. Well, let me just tell you, I have seen the film, and there's a scene in there. I mean, it's a, a film that's celebrated by many of the same people who would be lionizing Ta-Nehisi Coates. That's why I didn't go see it. Uh, there's a scene in there where the black character who is, uh, uh, has a girlfriend who's white and makes a visit to the family home is confronted by the father of the girlfriend who earnestly insists he wants him to know that he voted for President Obama twice, and he would have done so a third time if the man had been running the greatest president of his lifetime. Okay? And, of course, the point of that scene is that this unctuous kind of uh, almost self-flagellating demonstration of fealty to some idea that the black character is presumed to hold. I mean, that's my life. Yeah. This, this is exactly what you're describing. Now, when I saw the film, all the black people in the theater were practically out of their seats at this scene because they got it. They got why it was offensive for this white guy to be telling the black character that the white guy had voted for Barack Obama as if to try to win some kind of bona fides with the black character, as if he thought that who he voted for mattered to the black character or that his voting for Barack Obama made it okay. For all he knows, the black character didn't vote or thought Obama was an asshole. For all he, he knew, but he didn't take him seriously as an individual person enough. He projected something onto him. So anyway, people should understand why you're upset with this soft bigotry of uh, virtue signaling through the person of Mr. Coates. Uh, I get yeah. that. I have a different complaint. Please share. Uh, he's a good writer. But he's not a deep thinker. And he's being taken seriously as a deep thinker. He's a good writer who is uh, able very artfully and powerfully to render certain ideas and uh, impressions and concessions. He has a way with a line. Yes. Uh, you know, he's talented. I mean, there's not any doubt about that. But the actual analytical content of the argument, there are gaping holes in it, which some of these critics have, who have stuck their heads out of the foxhole recently uh, have been willing to um, uh, to point out. Um, and I think that Thomas Chatterton Williams in this review, and by the way, did you look at some of the comments at the New York Times in response to uh, Williams' review of, um, of Coates' book? 
To be honest, I assumed that I had already read them in an alternate universe. You mean the, the shit that he took? Well, no. Half of the comments you've read in an alternate universe. Mm -hmm. A third of the comments are actually saying, thank God. Thank God oh, somebody has comment. finally said this. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, it was uh, right. confirmation of your sense that uh, the wheel is turning a little bit. Because I'd say a good one-third of the commenters that I, I might have reviewed, a couple of dozen of them, I just, you know, scanned. Uh, we're saying, um, you know, I've always had this feeling in the back of my mind that something wasn't quite right here. Uh, and we should tell the, read, the list, uh, viewers here who haven't uh, seen Thomas Chatterton Williams' New York Times review of We Were Eight Years in Power, Ta-Nehisi Coates' latest book, who haven't seen it, that Williams uh, says, in effect, um, and I hope I don't do, uh, you know, discredit by this quick summary, that Coates' immersion in a racialist uh, conception of American society, everything viewed through the lens of race, is the mirror image or the flip side of a white nationalist conception about American society in which everything is viewed in terms of race. And Williams, in the review, includes extensive reportage from his interview of uh, Spencer, Richard Spencer, the white nationalist um, leader, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, and and uh, has Spencer saying back to him, in effect, I'm glad that people are eating up ta coats. I'm glad that they're taking it in because it's a thoroughly racialized conception. It's racial essentialism uh, at its utmost. And that primes them. They really believe in race, these liberals who are reading ta coats. And that means I can flip them, says Richard Spencer. The day will come, mm -hmm. given their belief in race, when I can persuade them that they're white. ta mm -hmm. coats wants them to regret and lament and eschew the fact that they're white. Mm -hmm. Richard Spencer dreams of a day in which them seeing themselves as white, they'll get tired of hating themselves and flip over to the side of being proud of being mm -hmm. white. <laughs> as some of those people <laughs> talk about having done. But Glenn, you know, let's let's be as fair as possible. Oh, do I feel I feel really uncomfortable. I have a bit of a Quaker background. I don't write about it much because it's long gone, but I feel a little uncomfortable openly saying, I don't find that person's reasoning very strong. I mean, hell, I don't. But my code is that I'm not supposed to say it. And so since we've done that, I want to make sure that we're giving him his full say. Now, Great. Coates's idea is that there's no reason for hope. That to say that, because a lot of the criticism is that his message is hopeless. And Coates is sitting there reading all this and thinking, well, suppose I'm correct. Suppose there is no reason for hope. Suppose, now, let's say, frankly, I think he does think it's 1950. I think he lacks reverse historical vision. But let's say that he, at least in some moods, understands that living in 1950 would have been much harder for all of us than it's been for a good 40 years, let's say. His idea might be that we're not going to get any further than that because there's something unique about the way the United States is at this point where we've kind of reached the end of history. Now, you and I are responsible for saying, what leads us to think that there's hope, especially for what you call in, a, in an article I still remember 25 years later, the third of black Americans who were left behind. Some people would say a quarter, some a third, but the black underclass, if we're still allowed to use that word. Not to mention underlying racial attitudes. My personal feeling is that those underlying racial attitudes beyond a certain point are not going away, but they don't matter as much as people say. But what about people who are really suffering? What's the hope? Suppose our prophet is correct, that we've gotten to a point where this is the best we can expect until the world gets blown up and we start again. Is he wrong? Yeah, I think he is wrong. For, but, on what grounds? But it's a, it's a fair question. Okay, so I'm reading uh, the history from uh, the early part of the 20th century, Gunnar Myrdal's book, uh, An American Dilemma. Mm -hmm. the, the scene That's that a book he, I've pretended to read all my life. That's yeah, right. yeah, well, you know, volume one is worth <laughs> your attention. It's a, it's a two-volume or three-volume with it's the appendices. Important. It goes on. It's an important book. Yeah. And the scene that it describes circa 1940 in America, uh, the condition of the American Negro, I mean, I don't know, something like uh, two-thirds of African-American women who are employed work as domestic servants. They were maids. Yeah. Uh, the vast bulk of the population is in the south of the United States. The New Deal has just been enacted, and it's really left blacks behind. And 
uh, so many ways. Uh, there are openly racist governments in power in you know uh, uh, dozens of states around uh, a dozen states around the country and uh, many jurisdictions. Uh, African Americans are excluded by law from various occupations and by conventional social practice from uh, all kinds of associations, schools, unions, uh, so forth and so on. The level of education, the level of poverty is uh, through the roof, and so on. Uh, and that is within almost living memory. I'm 69 years old. I was born in 1948. I mean, I came along just uh, less than a decade after Murdo yeah. published this study. They're very old people that, that's, who yes, remember it. Who remember it. Okay, that situation has completely uh, reversed itself. The power of the law. You don't think the Civil Rights Act of 1964 meant anything? You should go to the journals and read the papers of economists, sociologists, and political scientists, people, everybody from Richard Freeman, a, a very distinguished labor economist at Harvard, to William Julius Wilson, no uh, conservative he, a uh, social democrat, liberal African-American sociologist, and they all point out that the uh, transformative effect of those uh, uh, pieces of uh, legislation and so forth, look at the way the courts have moved. Look, look at how the national discourse has shifted. I mean, the idea that it's that, in effect, nothing has changed is just absurd. The other thing I'd say, I mean, there are many things I could say. America is a vast, dynamic, complex, interesting, profound society. Um, I mean, we are, we are changing by leaps and bounds. At the same time that uh, the U.S. Congress was enacting liberal civil rights legislation, they were liberalizing the immigration laws. Tens of millions of people have joined our society. I mean, people of color, people from Latin America and people from Asia and Africa. And by and large, they are prospering. Okay? The University of California, Berkeley, a majority of the students there are Asian. Uh, the same is true at Harvard, Stanford, not a majority, but a very significant uh, more, uh, minority of those students are Asian, and they have to be rationed out and pushed away. It's an open society. Uh, there's opportunity here. It's not a perfect society. It can be made better. Perhaps the minimum wage could be higher. Perhaps the attention to health care for the indigent could be greater. Uh, perhaps the uh, nastiness of uh, antipathy toward foreigners could be relaxed. But notwithstanding what anybody might reject in the uh, uh, presidential propaganda of Donald Trump, this is an interesting, it is a uh, dynamic, it's an open, it's a self-critical, it's a reform-oriented society. So this notion, this, this kind of cl closed, locked-in notion, to tell your child in the 21st century that there's no hope, uh, that, the, that the hounds will always be at their heels and the wind will always be in their face? Um, this is practically child abuse, in my view. People are right. dying in leaky boats to see such hope as exists here, and not a small number of them are black people. So, I, I, you yeah. know, so I'm, I'm objecting to that as a yeah. characterization but, of American society. But as I often do when I'm talking to you, I, wanna, I want us to try to put ourselves in his head, not... Okay. All right, John, uh, you've frozen. I don't know what's going on here. Okay. That. Sorry, 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 John. Yeah, we both froze, and I think I need you to start over. You want to put yourself in his head? Let's let's okay. just repeat from there. Okay, I'm going to just say it again. So. Okay, I get it, but I want to do something I often do when we're, we're talking like this. I want us to put ourselves in his head, and I think, first of all, we need to agree on an assumption that he is not a phony. He is sincere in this. I'm agreeing I do with not, him. Don't get the feeling that he's a huckster who's putting all of this yeah. on just to make a buck. Sure. He's a, yeah. So, he means all this, and I think that, for one thing, that there are two, two things. One, in his head, to the extent that I can get inside his head, what he thinks is, on the one hand, Emmett Till, and think about that happening in color, not a long time ago in black and white, Emmett Till, and then Tamir Rice, the poor pre-adolescent who just got shot in cold blood. Or, you know, it's sad, it's almost gotten to the point, and we've talked about the cops and black men and the, the dialogue about that, but let's face it, there's a meme that's in all of our heads now, which is roughly 
a black man of about 40 with a lot of tickets and probably some child support issues gets stopped somewhere in the South in his car. Right. And a white policeman shoots him while he's running away or shoots him while he's driving away. There have been about four of those. Yeah. So that sort of thing happens. And for Coates, I think it's look at Emmett Till and now look at this. They're only slightly different, black bodies, etc. Now, I don't think that that makes him ridiculous. And this is leading to my main question here. Yes, what Gunnar Myrdal described, which I have I've read about Gunnar Myrdal, I've never read the book. Yeah, we're, we're past that. And I think Coates would have to nod that we're, it would be, it's better now than it was in 1936. The Scottsboro Boys was a long time ago. But what we might, he might ask if he ever engaged in live debates with anybody or debated people in print other than saying fuck you to them. Basically, what he might ask, what has changed for black people in a significant way since about 1980? Because, of course, the fact that the president was black for 10 minutes was wonderful, as I always said. But what major difference did it make in terms of how anybody was living? Have we not perhaps hit a wall in modern America? I don't think that's a, a, a stupid point. He might have something there. I think that both of us feel that more could have happened if it weren't for, frankly, dialogue that people like him have a way of fostering, although I don't think we can nail exactly what the role is. But maybe we've hit a wall since about 1990, let's say. What's changed? Well, you know my – I think you know my uh, response, uh, which is that what's changed is that the constraint is not a closed door. The constraint is the developed capacities for us to perform. Uh, mm -hmm. That whereas uh, in the not too distant past, the opportunity would not have been there uh, at Columbia University or at Brown University. They weren't bending over backwards to appoint people of color to their faculty. They weren't investing money in diversifying, recruiting, uh, and so forth and so on. They weren't deeply steeped in the uh, ethos of affirmative action. They weren't flagellating themselves because they were only 7% and not 10% African American. Uh, all of that has changed. But whereas in 1960 it was a quarter of African American children born to women who weren't married, it's now two thirds. Uh, that uh, the uh, pathology. Glenn, I have to interrupt. I have to interrupt you very quickly. Coates would say, but that's because of deindustrialization and there's nowhere for the men to work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, say, and, don't and, you know that, Glenn? No, and my answer to that is take people, including our black people, seriously enough to think that they have a command over how we live and that the exigencies of deindustrialization are constraints that affect us, but they don't define us. And that if we were willing to make our narrative different instead of directing it to white people, presuming that they were moral agents who could be appealed to at the Atlantic Monthly's readership and elsewhere to make America better, if we were to take the same degree of intensity of moral criticism and direct it at ourselves about how we're living, how we're raising our children, and how our people are behaving, they're, we're gunning each other down in the bucket load in the cities of this country, and the only thing you have to say about it is that police are racist and police brutality? What about the barbarity of the people who are conducting these acts? What about the absence of a sense of, of human decency that has become so widespread in our community that it results in this uh, outcome? Of course, there are historical reasons for it. That doesn't mean that we can't change it. Do you really think we have to? Nobody is coming to save us. I don't care how many guilty white liberals uh, who have had their latte in the morning and want to pick up the Atlantic, nod their heads in affirmation at ta <laughs> Coates. Nobody <laughs> is coming to save us. If we don't raise our children, educate them, uh, form households which are healthy and uh, develop relationships in our interactions with one another, which foster our ability to seize these opportunities, impoverished peasants from other parts of the world will come here and pick up the gold that's lying on the street, and we'll have nothing but a lament. And 50 years from now, Ta-Nehisi Coates may still be being read, but you'll have a population of people who are so bereft of the capacity to perform in the modern world that they'll be wards of the state. Um, and, and that's not racism, okay? I mean, you can call it what you want to. The, the possibility of doing better lies in front of us. The country has demonstrated that malleability 
We need to man and woman up. That's what I would say. Yeah, Glenn, but... <laughs> you but, know but, but you think I'm wrong, or you just think it won't sell? Oh. oh, no, no. I agree with you. I think that it is not impossible in the world that we live in for there to be a black America that thinks more that way, that thinks more like immigrants. Although the classic answer there is you can't expect us to behave like immigrants, but more like immigrants. I think that if you could have a teach-in with all of black America, it would be almost... A message. I'm reading the new Muhammad uh, Ali biography right now. It would almost be a black Muslim message. The idea being, yes, the past was awful, and you know, even maybe some fake chauvinism would have to be stuck into it. But the idea being that we can make the most out of a bad hand, and that that's the only choice that we have, and that railing against something as abstract as white supremacy isn't going to work. But unfortunately, I think that um, it's interesting based on you know blog exchanges I used to have with him way back in the day. I can just hear it. He's going to he, he he's gonna say, well, John, he's not, not that I mean that he's going to say it, but he would say, John, how do you know whenever I would make one of these surmises? How do you know when it was a surmise based on the way human beings work, the way specific ones such as him work? You know, it's just an educated guess. Educated guess is that his response to what you just said would be some well-crafted line about white supremacy. And, you know, there's a certain audience who would just, you know, applaud. The white supremacy has to go away. How can you tell people to take control of their destiny when something is as implacable as this white supremacy? And, yeah, I think it's a it's a flabby position. It's it's not what I would call sustained reasoning. It's it's. It's emotional. It's almost artistic. I didn't say autistic. I said artistic. And I think it's an unfortunate message for so many smart, concerned people to be taking. It makes sense to Coates. So many people have said to me in private, they would never say it in public, in private, why in the world would that be your message to your son? I'd be very interested to see the book that his son is going to write in about 20 years. But for him, it makes perfect sense that you would say that because you're protecting them against something that's so, so, so preternaturally implacable as this white supremacy. But, you know, there is hope, just as right now as it happens here in Queens, some sun just has come through the clouds. <laughs> there is some hope in that I think a certain segment of not only the white, but the black reading public is finally coming to understand that this prophet has a message that is somewhat out of step with reality and more to the point is of, of no use. It's interesting, quickly. About six months ago, I was talking to some, <laughs> some very nice white people, educated <laughs> upper middle class white people. <laughs> one of them a New Yorker, one of them Australian, actually. And it was interesting, the, the gradients in their response. They had been to one of these sessions where ta Between the World and Me was assigned for discussion. And I had had one glass of wine. I usually just, I, I, it's like judo. As soon as he comes up, I mumble something and we move on. But I had had a glass of wine. And I said, do you two realize that that man hates you? And they had never thought about it that way. And I said, think about it. Think about it. And I gave the three passages that I've memorized about it. And no, I still have not read it. But <laughs> I know about those passages. And I said, you realize it's not just miss this person out in Pennsylvania. He hates you. And I said, do you think you deserve it? And the American one said, well, I like to know what the roots of all of this hatred is. I want to know how he feels. I'm glad to have read it. And I said, but no, no. Do you think you deserve his hatred? I'm not talking about cops. Do you deserve it? And I could tell that on that, it was like trying to make somebody perceive ultraviolet light because the person knew what I meant. But you weren't supposed to say that. And I said, do you realize that that discussion session you weren't supposed to discuss it. You were supposed to worship it. Do you realize that that was a religious service that you were at? And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you weren't allowed to say anything except hallelujah. The Australian got it. He said, well, actually, yeah, that's true. But the American, I could tell that they got it. But that just wasn't to be said. Not that she was trying to save my feelings as a black person because she and I are friends, but she's just not supposed to say that. I am seeing over the past few weeks that there's a little bit less of that. And so to me, that is a ray of sunshine 
through the clouds because this response is so demeaning, you know. And so, yes, here we're talking about how we don't like the response to his book because it's about us. And you know what? I own it. Yes, I don't like feeling discriminated against. And that's what this response feels like. And so just like his writing, which tends to come from him and then radiate outward, I'm talking about a feeling that's all about me, between my world and me. And so I'm happy to see that there's some sign of change. I John, can't believe you've gotten me to say this much about that person, but I guess I had to get it out. No, this is epic, man. This is, this is one for the books. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that if you're willing. I, I think uh, we have John Unchained. You've seen Django Unchained? <laughs> <laughs> that I saw. <laughs> All right. Now <laughs> we're seeing a little bit less blood on the floor, but some of the same emotive power. John McWhorter uh, Unchained, and I was proud to be a part of it, a 